Hey guys, it's Ryan. Um, this video, we're going to jump over to the other um, big picture topic and talk about mechanics. So we talked all about biology of tooth movement. Now we're going to talk about how the heck a bracket and wire uh, move a tooth, how they apply force on a tooth. So here's a stress strain curve. And this is literally, I mean, we could probably spend God knows how much time on this, but there's so much information here, and it's really, really important. Um, so we're going to kind of dissect this one step at a time. Um, a stress-strain curve it explains behavior of any elastic material. So um, as I'm talking, if you have like a paper clip nearby and or a rubber band, that might be really helpful just to kind of understand this stuff a little bit more. So if you get a paper clip and rubber band, that'd be awesome. So um, let's start just by looking at the axes. So we have stress on the y-axis. This is measured in typically megapascals for ortho and strain, which is um, a distance. And I, I guess I should define these things. So this is similar to a force displacement curve. It looks kind of similar. Force is simply a load that you, um, that an object or something applies to something else. You push on something, you pull on something, you're applying a force. Displacement is the distance that that object moves in response to the force. So that's force and displacement. And those are external your um, it's external to the object experiencing the force and experiencing the displacement. Stress and strain. Stress is internal force and strain is internal displacement. Instead of a person pushing on a box, it's the wire itself is getting bent and experiencing the stress and strain within itself. So you can think in terms of stress being an internal force and strain being an internal displacement um, or internal deflection. Um, that is what these terms mean. So stress is megapascals and strain is some millimeters or something like that of distance. Um, now for, um, I guess we can just talk quickly about all, what all these things mean. Um, so the first part of this graph, um, I, I colored blue, and that's for elastic deform, uh, deformation. So with the rubber band, if you pull it apart and let it come back together, um, it's undergoing elastic uh, deformation because as you pull it apart, it's changing shape. And as soon as you let go of the force, um, as soon as it's no longer experiencing that stress, it reverts back to its original shape. Um, if you've ever seen like those rubber band animal um, wristband things, I mean, I never wore them or anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying. If you've ever, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, like they're kind of shaped like different an, an animal or something, and you wear it on your wrist and you stretch it out, and as soon as you take them off, they revert back to their original shape. So that's something that's undergoing elastic deformation. It's not a permanent change, whereas. Plastic deformation is just that. So if you took the paper clip and you were to bend it a little bit and it stays where it where you bent it to, it underwent plastic deformation. Um, but if you were to say push on the uh, on the paper clip a little bit and have it bend but not and then have it like snap back to its original form, that's when it's still undergoing elastic deformation. It's when you push you have to push a certain, has a certain threshold here. You have to apply a certain amount of stress and uh, a certain amount of force and the paper clip has to experience a certain amount of stress and strain to get to a point where it undergoes a permanent um, physical change and you'd have to bend it back to where it originally started from. So um, that's kind of the difference between elastic and plastic uh, deformation. Um, so let's talk this through. We have this linear part of the curve to start in the elastic deformation zone. That abides by Hooke's law, which says, 
you know, stress and strain have a linear relationship, and the slope of that is called the elastic um, modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. Um, and so the more vertical that this slope is, the stiffer an object is. So think the paper clip is going to have a much steeper slope, and a um, more horizontal slope is going to be a springier object. So think the rubber band will be more horizontal here in this region. And then, so we're going up, we're applying more and more force, more it's, the object's experiencing more and more stress, and we reach the proportional limit, which is the highest point on this graph and I have I have to say this part gets a little bit confusing even like different sources online disagree on some of the definitions of these things but um, I'm going to try to explain it the clearest I can proportional limit is the highest point on this curve where it's linear so as soon as you get past this it's not really it's still kind of elastic but it's not like totally elastic because it's not abiding by Hooke's law so proportional limit is purely mathematical um, for this point along the curve where it's no longer straight line. At this point, we get a little bit fuzzy. We're kind of at the elastic limit. If you were tugging on the rubber band, it would still feel elastic. But if you tug um, enough, you'll reach the yield strength of the rubber band or, or yield point. And that's where... Um, it deviates from elastic nature, it deviates from elasticity at a measurable lev level. So they say about 0.1% plastic deformation. So basically you can't really tell, but if you were to um, pull on the rubber band past this point, it's no longer going to go back completely to its original shape. It'll stay a little bit more stretched out than it started out as. Um, and then we go a little bit further along this curve and we reach the ultimate tensile strength, which is the maximum load an object can sustain. So that's the maximum amount of force. Anything beyond that, um, the object's going to fail or break. So you pull um, past this point, you reach the failure point, the rubber band snaps. Um, so that's basically, that's basically all those points. Um, and then we can talk about the area under the curve. So the area under the curve of the elastic portion is called resilience, which is essentially the energy storage capacity of the object as you're stretching the rubber band and you release it. It has some sort of energy associated with that, is some potential energy built up as you, you know, stretch it out and let it go. So that's resilience. Not really important to ortho. Um, I forgot we we're talking about orthodontics here for a second. And then formability is the area under the curve of the plastic portion um, of the curve, and that's much more relevant to ortho. And that's the ability to undergo uh, plastic deformation without breaking. So it's like if you have an um, orthodontic wire and you're um, pushing on it, you're bending it, you're... Um, forming it essentially you're changing its shape it's undergoing plastic deformation um, but it's not snapping it's not breaking so that's a really ideal trait you typically want a wire that can be formed um, a stainless steel wire that can be formed is really useful um, and while we're talking about orthodontic wires there are really three um, three main components that are all in here somewhere strength stress, uh, strength, or is it, I guess I didn't list this, but strength, springiness, and range are the three um, super important uh, qualities of an orthodontic wire. Um, let's see, I want to see if I can, I guess I can't draw. Oh yeah, maybe I can. So um, strength is the best definition I can come up with is how much force the wire can resist before permanently deforming. Or sometimes it refers to how much force before it breaks. So um, that's how so it's kind of like the force that the wire can withstand before permanent deformation occurs. Um, so strength kind of 
has to do with these three points. It has to do with the height of the curve. It has to do with how the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength, which is useful because they have strength in the title. Um, and so it has to do more with the how much load the wire can can resist without breaking or without permanently deforming. Um, springiness has to do with this right here, with the slope. As we talked about, we talked more vertical, stiffer, more horizontal, springier. And so stiffness is essentially the just the opposite. It's um, the complete one, one over E is referring to um, that. So, um, and stiffness is actually very important because stiffness directly tells you how much force a wire will put on a bracket that's out of place. So if you have a wire that's formed to the arch, it's super stiff and you have to bend it out to reach a bracket that's out of place. The stiffness tells you it's going to want to get back to its original shape and so um, it's going to apply a lot, of a lot of force on that bracket to get back to where it wants to be. And then um, range is the third most important and that's really this horizontal line going from the yield strength to zero point. And that's the, um, the range, really short for range of action, which is how far um, a wire will bend before permanently distorting. Um, so it's really this, it's basically, you know, and the elastic limit gets a little bit fuzzy here. So some people say range is here to proportional limit. Some people say it's here to elastic limit. Um, but it's from somewhere in this elastic portion of the curve, this um, x distance. And it's how much, again, how much, um, how far uh, the distance that the wire um, can bend elastically before it loses its elasticity before it's permanently distorted. Um, so those three components are super critical. Um, the strength is how much force a wire can withstand. The springiness is essentially the flexibility, how far um, the wire will bend under a given load, and the range of action, how far it will bend before permanently distorting. Um, and then the performance of the material depends on both what the material is made out of and its specific geometry. So really fast here. Treatment typically um, goes from NITI to TMA, which is um, the beta titanium, to stainless steel in this order from springy to stiffer. Um, why is this? Because um, if you start out with a wire that's too stiff, you'll start out number one with a force that's probably too heavy initially, a force that decays too quickly, and you could potentially pop off a bracket that's really far out of place. Um, so we start with Naitai, but why don't we just stick with this? Well, if we have a wire that's too weak, if we bite on a hard piece of candy or something, we could potentially permanently distort the Naitai wire if it's not strong because it will won't take much force before it permanently distorts because remember that's the definition of strength and it will lose its elasticity and it won't want to revert back to its original shape um, so that's a problem um, and that's basically what I say here Naitai you can't form as easily it won't um, bend, if you want to change its shape it won't um, listen to you essentially and then stainless steel um, will respond to your bends much better um, and then, just for geometry, a round wire uh, slides through brackets, whereas a rectangular wire enables you, in a rectangular wire um, bracket slot, enables you to apply torque. Um, if we double the diameter, uh, we increase strength, we increase stiffness, and we half the range of action. And if we increase the length of something, um, we decrease strength, we increase springiness, and increase range. And these things, if you kind of think about thickening a wire, you know, you think it, it makes sense that it would become stronger and stiffer, and if you increase the length of a wire, it makes sense it wouldn't be as strong and has more range of flexibility. And then um, these calculations are for Q 
cantilevers, so, so a wire is supported only on one side, so that would be like at the distal most portion of the mouth. And a supporting beam is pretty much everywhere else between two brackets, and this is kind of like a fast calculation. You add two to you multiply strength by two if it's loosely attached to both sides of the beam, and if it's tightly fixed, you can multiply the strength by four. Um, and then, really fast, uh, rubber bands, they're really useful. Uh, they have a great elastic range. You can stretch them really far, and they still have a good amount of strength, but they fatigue really quickly. They absorb water in the mouth, they deteriorate, their elastic performance gets weaker after, uh, over time, so they're, they fatigue a lot quicker than metal does. Um, so it causes tip, uh, more like an interrupted force rather than a continuous, quote-unquote, continuous force. Alright guys, um, thanks so much for watching. I hope these videos were helpful. And um, leave a like if you found them helpful. And um, I'll see you all next time.